Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. It's a joint webinar between the NOAA One Health and NOAA's Gulf of Mexico Regional Collaboration Team, which is part of the NOAA Regional Collaboration Network. Before we get started today, I want to let our audience know that we are recording today's webinar. It will be available for viewing in a few days, and you'll be able to find it on the NOAA One Health and NOAA Regional Collaboration websites. Once again, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Kristen Larson, and I am NOAA's Gulf of Mexico Regional Coordinator. Today, I will be joined co in co-facilitating today's event with Asia Shumalo, the NOAA West Regional Coordinator. Thank you so much, Asia. Today's webinar, as I mentioned, is part of the Regional Collaboration Network and NOAA One Health. NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, if you are not familiar with it, is a network of employees across NOAA connecting our work to improve NOAA's service to the nation. The regional teams around the country periodically coordinate events like today's webinar to educate NOAA staff and partners about NOAA programs. As such, it's also part of our Gulf of Mexico Forum webinar series, which takes place every other month on a bunch of different topics around the region. Before we get going, I'd like to run through a few webinar housekeeping items. First, for audio, it's available either via the webinar computer interface or the phone line that you can see in your webinar drop-down screen. If you're joining by phone, please enter your audio pin to enable audio controls. And if you don't know where the audio pin is, it's right here in the drop-down menu. If you can see my arrow, there's also a big red arrow pointing to it and it's circled. If you've already entered it, then you're good and you won't be able to see that. A couple of other things, as I mentioned, we are recording, so please don't share any personal or business identifiable information. Participants will be joined to the audio in mute status. And except for presenters, please leave your webcam off. That just lets everybody focus on the presenter. Asia and I will be monitoring the question box for written questions to share during the Q&A after each speaker. And with that, I would like to turn it, turn it over to Morgan Sabau to tell us a little bit more about NOAA One Health. Thanks so much, Kristen. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. My name is Morgan Zabo, and I work in NOAA's Climate Program Office and help to coordinate the NOAA One Health Group. So before we get started with our presentations today, I wanted to give you all a little background about One Health and the upcoming One Health Summit. So if you're unfamiliar with the One Health concept, One Health applies a collaborative, multidisciplinary, and cross-sector approach to address potential or existing risks at the interface of humans, animals, plants, and the ecosystems. The One Health concept recognizes that the health of humans is extricably linked with the health of aquatic organisms, plants, and the environment. And the work within One Health creates conditions for economic vitality and growth and supports scientifically sound, environmentally sustainable, and just practices and policies. And NOAA has a One Health team, and we will be hosting the first NOAA One Health Summit in Washington, D.C. from August 15th through 16th later this year. The One Health Summit in August will bring together scientists and practitioners across the agency to connect and highlight NOAA's work on health and related issues and with the health sector that, that supports the One Health approach. I want to note to you all that we're accepting abstracts to participate in the summit through June 12th, and I will put the link to the submissions in the chat shortly. So in preparation for the One Health Summit, we're hosting a webinar series to highlight a single aspect of health work being done in the eight NOAA regions. Today's webinar is the third in the series and focuses on seafood safety in the Gulf of Mexico region. And while we're highlighting this aspect of health work in the Gulf, please be aware that there are examples of almost every one health thematic area in every region around the country. And we hope that you can join us for future webinars in the series between now and July. And of course, we hope that you can join us for the One Health Summit, either in person or virtually. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, Morgan. And today I am very excited to welcome our two speakers on seafood safety. And while I am speaking through the bayou, bayous, speaking through the bios, Paul, I am going to uh, turn the presentation view over to you. All right. Paul, I just made you the presenter. All right, so Dr. Paul Mickle is currently the co-director of the Northern Gulf Institute, associate director of Geosystems Research Institute and associate research professor at Mississippi State University. Previously, he served as a chief scientific officer 
for the Mississippi Department of Marine Resources. For more than 15 years, Dr. Mickle has managed multiple projects and programs focusing on ecological restoration and fisheries production. As a Northern Gulf of Institute co-director, Dr. Mickle works directly with NOAA, assisting with Cooperative Institute-focused projects ranging from database product development to hypoxia monitoring research. And real quick, I will also introduce our second speaker, Dr. John Bell. Dr. Bell is the director of NOAA Fisheries National Seafood Inspection Laboratory, which is part of the Office of Sustainable Fisheries. Dr. Bell previously served as the NOAA Louisiana Sea Grant Seafood Specialist and Extension Professor of Food Science at Louisiana State University, providing seafood safety and quality expertise to seafood processors and harvesters. Dr. Bell also worked in various capacities in the canned tuna industry and studied onboard handling and thermal processing of tuna during his academic education. And everybody, please remember, we'll have a quick break between Paul and John's presentations for a few questions, and then more time for Q&A after John's talk. Remember, if you have questions during the webinar, please enter them into the question pane during the discussion, and Asia and I will be watching for those. Thank you. With that, I will turn it over to Paul. Thank you, Kristen. Um, can everybody see the, the screen okay? All right. Yes, great. we can see it and hear you just fine. All right, terrific. Well, thank you all. I really appreciate the invitation, Kristen and Asia. Um, this is a very important piece of work for our institute, which I appreciate the, the interest. And I'd like to share today a little bit about it, the detail and, and link it to seafood safety of the modeling work that the institute's doing. Uh, just a quick plug for the institute itself. Uh, we are a cooperative institute with NOAA. And within our institute, we have six universities ranging from Dolphin Island Sea Lab, which is a consortium of of all the public universities in Alabama, uh, Florida State University, Mississippi State University, uh, which I'm a professor of, uh, University of Southern Mississippi, uh, Louisiana State University, and the University of Alabama at Hun Huntsville. Um, so that's the, that's the institute. Uh, in general, we do a lot of work with NOAA and all the line offices. Uh, but what I'd like to share today particularly is some modeling work that we do, uh, so water quality modeling uh, work that we do um, to try to understand the flow dynamics in the Northern Gulf, and specifically here today in the state of Mississippi and the Mississippi Sound. Uh, I wanna lead in by just uh, making sure everyone understands that the oyster population that I'm gonna focus on uh, today is in the state waters of Mississippi and has been drastically reduced uh, because primarily of water quality issues um, in the Northern Gulf and the Mississippi Sound proper. Uh, oyster populations are, are around 10% of the historical average um, mostly because of uh, many different factors influencing water quality of much wetter years than we've seen uh, over the last 20 years have been much wetter uh, than the previous 100 uh, and, and in longer periods. And we've had more Bonnie Carey spillway openings, which is a spillway that operates uh, to flood control on the Mississippi River. Um, it's, it's open more times, uh, it's open six times in the last seven years uh, versus um, 15 times over the last 100. So you can see that the frequency has gone up quite a bit of the opening and being such a large opening causes uh, different water qualities in the Mississippi Sound as it's in the tailwaters. Um, but understanding the water qualities there, I, I really just link it to oysters because they're great to understand with seafood safety and the regulatory structure for this uh, purpose of this talk here today. Uh, because they're sessile, they don't move around uh, and they are served uh, in the uh, commerce as a, a raw shellfish, it falls under a very uh, uh, proper stru policy structure uh, ensured by the uh, Food and Drug Administration as well as the, the state of Mississippi's Mississippi Department of Marine Resources. And these different harvest levels uh, are designated as approved, which means you can harvest year round and uh, sell those uh, shellfish uh, as raw in, in the national marketplace as well as conditionally approved, which means when there are certain conditions, uh, whether it be reduced rainfall, certain river stages, river levels, uh, and it's all depictional on each different um, zone, they can be conditionally approved, and that allows for harvest during certain conditions. And then there's restricted um, and prohibited. Uh, both of those are uh, prohibit uh, oyster harvest from them directly, but the interesting thing about restricted is it allows for a process called depuration, where raw, where, where the, the shellfish, the oysters can be harvested and then moved into an approved area 
or in a, into a laboratory or a depuration facility uh, to allow cleansing of approved type water qualities uh, as they filter out for a certain amount of time and then they can be um, uh, sold in the commercial marketplace. So it's, it's an interesting balance between the federal and state uh, policy structures and management agencies to really allow safe uh, seafood and, and uh, safe regulatory structure uh, for the commerce of the species of oysters. Um, the state of Mississippi suffers from very weak tides. Uh, a lot of y'all listening here today, whether you're located on a coast or not, usually think about tidal swings between four and six feet uh, in most of the areas of our coastal country. Uh, in the state of Mississippi, because of its anatomy and where it's located, uh, the strongest tides we see even in the summertime at the heights are about two and a half, 2.6, 2.8 feet. Uh, swing, so right around not even a meter. So when you start thinking about that, uh, those those weak tidal swings can cause some water quality uh, issues just from a natural perspective. Um, when you have uh, a, a large urban area, um, which spans about 60 uh, miles across the, the state of Miss, the coastal zone of Mississippi, and the amount of uh, septic tanks and, and sewer systems uh, in those urban areas, you can really imagine that uh, this can cause some uh, very uh, difficult management perspectives of trying to improve water qualities uh, and playing with these uh, FDA approved levels of approved, conditionally approved and restricted uh, zones. Um, it's, it's a really interesting place because we have stratification. Uh, in the summertime, we see very warm temperatures and because of the weak tides, uh, we get uh, heavy stratification in the water column, uh, which can affect uh, bacterial colonies uh, in the way that they uh, transport around. And what my institute does and the, a lot of the scientific staff that we have here is executing multiple models, water quality and uh, transport models to understand flow dynamics as well as bacterial transport of sourcing, whether it be point source or non-point source uh, type of tracing. So understanding that, uh, what we try to do and try to help out with is understand uh, these different areas of conditionally approved and approved and see if we can actually do some water quality modeling to look at some point source uh, identifications uh, in the bays and the urban areas to uh, really provide a, a prioritization list uh, to the managers, whether it be uh, Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality or the city municipalities themselves uh, to take on some of the infrastructure funds that they are uh, due to receive over the next five years and see if they can get the most bang for their buck. So they say, uh, to try to uh, become as efficient as they can and see those water quality improvements. Um, this is just a very busy slide. I apologize for the shrinking that went on, but uh, I really just wanted to make the point of showing how we use these models uh, in space and time uh, to, tr to really understand how the water moves and how we can backtrace uh, these point origins of some of the bacterial uh, vectors of how they move around and settle in these different areas. Uh, once we do that and the, the model is or the models are calibrated and uh, validated, um, we, they can be quite uh, informative tools on allowing certain areas to be prioritized uh, in restoration efforts, efforts and uh, infrastructure efforts. Um, with, as far as the restoration goals for seafood safety, uh, there are quite a few. Uh, there's some areas that the state of Mississippi, as well as the FDA, would really like to see uh, increase in those uh, policy labels from going from conditionally approved to approved or even prohibited to uh, conditionally approved. So trying to understand those certain areas in space and time is quite an intricate complex when you start thinking about mixing rates of fresh versus salt from the drainages that uh, encapsulate the perimeter of the Mississippi Sound as well as the marine interface uh, of to the estuary itself, as well as uh, prevailing winds, um, seasonal dynamics, uh, winter fronts, all these different things uh, come into play with tidal uh, variation to try to understand and verify and validate these uh, multiple model approaches. Um, I'd like to say that we've, we've had some successes. It's not just uh, academic to, to this point. Uh, there were some early a very simplistic modeling efforts done in the Biloxi Bay area on the right side of this of this uh, map here. And you can see uh, pretty much right uh, around the Biloxi, they call that Point Cadet, 
there was a very large effort after uh, Hurricane Katrina. There was a large slug of infrastructure funds to the area. And um, the municipalities, as well as the state, uh, were very um, thoughtful in their future, uh, future thought process and in instigated some very large infrastructure projects using some very simplistic models uh, back in 2016, um, I'm sorry, uh, 2006 to 2016 um, to uh, change over infrastructure in certain areas to allow for uh, septic to be converted to sewer and other stormwater uh, projects in the municipalities. And I'd like to say that in 2017, um, there was a, a designation change from prohibited to conditionally approved uh, right in Biloxi, and that was one of the most productive areas about 100 years ago. And we had had, we had the first uh, commercial orvis, uh, oyster harvest um, in 2017 and 57 years. So when you think about, um, you, there are success stories out there. Uh, the, the informative nature of some of the simplistic models back in the day have shown success. Uh, we have very uh, more complex and much stronger confidence intervals in our models now. So we look forward to delivering prioritization lists um, to the managers and uh, other municipalities that can really dial into uh, understanding the, the, the areas where if, a, if an infrastructure or restoration project could be implemented, would have the largest uh, positive impact as far as uh, just the policy structure of uh, designation of seafood safety harvest. So um, the ancillary benefits of such approaches are, are, are healthier oyster populations, as well as uh, more opportunity to sustainably harvest in these areas. Um, there would be decreased beach closures um, in the state of Mississippi because of uh, the bacterial tracing and the restoration that could reduce those levels. Uh, you can imagine the tourism perception that you would you would see and understand um, based on the improvement of water quality and the list goes on. So really understanding uh, those those efforts from both a science and a policy perspective is a pretty interesting thing, at least to me it is, uh, of allowing science to inform policy, which is uh, a difficult thing to do in a lot of circles. And um, we haven't had a, a, a great amount of success, but uh, I, can, I can say that we've had some outputs that have been informative and have helped um, raise the uh, capabilities of such efforts. And uh, hopefully we can keep moving on with larger um, restoration projects, uh, mostly from BP funds, uh, the, three, the three funding uh, streams there that, that flow into the state of Mississippi and, and such projects that, that fit the, uh, the type of mold that we're talking about here today. And I'll leave it out on my last slide. Feel free to uh, switch over, uh, Kristen or Asia, um, to the, any other subsequent um, presentations, and I'll take any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, and just a reminder to folks to enter any questions you have in the questions pane in the control panel. Um, and so I'll, I'll start with a few questions for you uh, while we have you. What, is you. what do you feel is the largest issue with seafood safety, specifically with fecal coliform? Yeah, I'd say the largest issue is really just understanding um, the, the point sourcing or non-point sourcing. So when you think about when the policy process of trying to understand seafood safety and oyster uh, consumption, a lot of the times, uh, a lot of people are trying to understand, is it way up river? Is it just down at the mouth? Is it industry uh, related? Or, or is it um, just very uh, broad based septic systems on, on the coastal areas, which is a much different approach. So those are very large unknowns. And if you're gonna spend a lot of money trying to take that on, um, you better put some understanding in whether it's point source or non-point source and things like that. So I would say that's the toughest thing. The largest concern is, is really understanding the sourcing uh, to it to save money and have impact. Thank you for that answer. Um, another question, uh, how do the models perform in extreme dry years or extreme wet years? Good question. Yes. So. Uh, when you have very wet years, obviously the, the freshwater influx in the state of Mississippi is anatomically has a north-south coastline. Um, so when you have very wet years, you have massive influence uh, with lower salinities and things like that. Uh, in dry years, um, water quality for the, for the most part goes up in those conditionally approved areas uh, for seafood safety, uh, with shellfish particularly, uh, are, come into season as allowable for harvest. 
Um, so when you think about that delicate balance of fresh and salt, those extreme years can cause some, some issues from a regulatory standpoint and just an aquatic species mortality standpoint of whether it's too salty, um, the oyster drills, which is a predator of oysters, can come in and cause mortality, but you have approved areas. So it's a balance and a complicated uh, dance, so to speak. And when you have very wet years, you can have oyster mortality from osmo-regulated osmo stress because they're freshed out is the, is the common term for it. Um, so understanding that and understanding those extremes uh, is very important for managers and models can account for those uh, extremes without actually having them happen. Unfortunately, they have happened, but it's, it's understandable when you just have it one time, if you can model it 30, 40 times and really understand what the drivers are. Great, thank you. And I'll do one more question for you before we turn it over to Dr. Bell. Um, do you have enough data um, and is there enough data available to allow these models to be accurate and informative? Yes, we all want more data. All modelers are, are data limited. I've never met one that wasn't. <laughs> If they were, they were, they were lying about it. But uh, the good news is we've had some wonderful advances uh, really from the federal side of USGS. Uh, we have a lot of gauging stations in the Mississippi Sound. Um, this is really a, a point of uh, um, success from relationships of the state and federal side. Um, we have a lot of interest uh, in funding from the state side uh, to help with USGS. So there's a lot of shared funding there. So it's not one-sided. So we do have a lot of gauge stations in the area. And then we have a lot of academic institutions on the coast itself uh, doing a lot, of, uh, a lot of monitoring and things like that. So we are heavily dated limited, especially on the nutrient side and bacterial side. Uh, a lot of my focus of the RFPs and the grants that we're submitting now are, are aimed at monitoring so we can beef up data going into the models. Um, but as far as physiochemical data, I would say we're um, par or, or maybe a tick above par, but from the other sides of bacterial uh, nutrient sediment, um, we are quite uh, poor data poor. Um, so always a need for that. Uh, that's the expensive part. Believe it or not, the modeling is the cheaper part, um, but uh, very, very important to understand uh, and a priority for the state and the nation itself. Great, thank you. Um, and with that, um, hopefully we'll be able to be around at the end to take a couple more questions. But with that, we're going to turn it over to Dr. John Bell. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see if I can successfully pull up my presentation. Um, okay, great. Thank you so much for the invitation um, to the One Health seminar here on seafood safety. Um, I am the director of um, NOAA Fisheries or National Marine Fisheries Service, as it used to be known. It's a national seafood inspection laboratory here in Pascagoula, Mississippi. That's a, a photo there of, of the facility. Um, just as, as Dr. Paul went into um, a bit of detail about the, the oyster harvesting and, it, and issues that he's dealing with in Mississippi, what I hope to do is give more of a an overview with a lot less specifics, just to how seafood background in seafood safety and how it's regulated, and then give some examples of how NOAA interacts with that. Um, so NOAA is not the, the regulator for seafood in the United States marketplace. And then I'll talk a little bit at the end about my program and um, another program we work strongly with, um, the Seafood Inspection Program. Um, thankfully, I thought the, the whole talk would be of this last subject, but I found myself falling asleep, so thought maybe I add a little bit more interest in background. Um, I also have an introduction of myself here um, that was already covered, but I have a PhD in food science, um, as well as a bachelor's and master's as well. Um, I did a lot of my graduate work on tuna and ha onboard handling and then cannery processing. Worked 10 years in the seafood industry, mostly in the Cantuna industry. And then I was a Louisiana Sea Group Seafood Specialist and LSU, that's right, the Sports University um, Extension Professor in Food Science. So yes, I was paid to talk about seafood. So I will do my best not to go too crazy. And then now I've been the director here at NISL for nine years. <clears throat> so I've had a background in industry, academia, and now the federal government in uh, seafood 
industry and seafood safety. So just a very brief background um, about the regulation of seafood in the U.S. marketplace, and that has been given to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, whereas the organization that I work for, NOAA Fisheries, is the management regulation of the fishing and other things that happen in federal waters. The, the FDA is required to regulate and control the safety of seafood products or fisheries products in the U.S. Um, um, they're, that this, they also regulate the safety of other food, um, along with the USDA that has some of those requirements as well for meat and poultry. But with all of that, including seafood, the very basic part of seafood safety and, is the regulation and application of good manufacturing practices in seafood processing facilities. And basically, that is in our efforts that are across the facility. Um, things like pest control or, or sanitation. You, you're not gonna do it just in one specific area, that's gonna be um, facility-wide. And the goal is to keep the filth off the food. That's what your basic sanitation. In 1997, the Seafood HACCP Act was implemented by the FDA and then that's more of a focus on preventative measures versus general um, sanitation and, and then measuring with end product testing. So seafood HACCP, that's the acronym I'm using. The HA stands for hazard analysis. So a seafood processor has to evaluate what the species, what is the product that they are going to be processing and evaluate potential seafood ha hazards in that. So for example, if you are processing tuna, you might have different potential hazards and things you wanna focus on than if you were processing salmon or shrimp. And then the CCP, which um, talks about critical control points, that's focusing your process on the hazards you might encounter and how you would remove them or decrease them so they would render the product safe. So things like if you were going to be a canner or vacuum packager, or if it was fresh product, you would have focus on the specific steps in your process that would again control food safety hazards. Okay, so with that, a very one screen coverage, um, I wanna just go into some examples and a segue is the NOAA Sea Grant, so that's a component of NOAA, that has helped develop training in seafood HACCP for seafood processors. Um, this is a, a consortium. It's, it's included um, state sea grant programs and seafood specialists. Um, this is uh, this this program of seafood HACCP training is part of AFDO. They they house the program. Um, American Food and Drug Officials. It's a certification certified training required by the HACCP Act. So as part of the, the um, Seafood HACCP Act, training, certified training of C by seafood processors is required. And so this whole program was developed with the FDA, as well as Sea Grant specialists, AFTO members, as well as industry associations and others. And the goal was to provide a low cost training program with the low cost being that it's it's presented a lot of it by these um, act, seafood specialists that are paid by universities to provide and meet the food safety training certification requirements that processors need to have. It's a requirement to be able to sell seafood products in the United States marketplace. So this is required even, no, no matter where the seafood is processed, whether in the United States or in overseas locations, they still have to meet these requirements. And that's that was a big lift by Sea Grant. It's a part of NOAA, but it's it's um they're generally state programs. They are state programs that um similar to land grant programs across the nation, these are for in, in states that are coastal states, and the program is usually housed in the land grant university, such as Mississippi State that um, Paul was talking about earlier. Um, so with that, I thought, again, another example of where NOAA has interacted and collaborated for the seafood safety of the nation. Um, one that um, you may remember in this area was the oil spill and the deep water 
horizon disaster. Um, NOAA was in the in the immediate aftermath was quick to partner with the U.S. FDA as well as the um, Gulf of Mexico states. And what happened after that? I'm you know just about the seafood safety. Obviously, there is a myriad of things that happened in response to that disaster. Um, NOAA, as the, the the management of federal waters, instigated preventative closing of all the waters to harvest. So immediately after that, you could not harvest in any of the, you could not go harvest seafood in these waters in the Gulf of Mexico based on um, NOAA's um, classifications of it, well, areas. So then the reopening of these areas so that then seafood could be harvested was based on sensory and chemical testing. So NOAA Fisheries was given the task to set up this program um, led by the Seafood Inspection Program, um, and it was based here in Pascagoula at, at our NISL facility with help from the Science Centers as well. So, with, at, so an overview of what happened is that after the, the waters were closed and then they, they could be opened to harvest if they were far away from the spill or the spill was being cleaned up by other actions as the, you know, the events went farther and farther in time, that you would, if you would have to get, get to a water and, and wish to open it. Now first, the sensory, initial sensory part is that there, there couldn't be any oil in the water, either by visual or by smell. So if, if you went out to try to determine, hey, we want to open this section of water for harvest, and there was still oil there, nothing happened. It remained closed. But as, as conditions improved, then samples, both water and of seafood, were collected from these sites, and then with under um, established sample collection and, and, and holding and, and transportation uh, procedures. They were delivered here to Pascagoula, the, um, the Na National Seafood Inspection Laboratory building, and they were entered into our sample control system, which may seem very obvious, but it's a critical part of any type of data based on sampling. You have to make sure that you have control of the sample and then control the data that's linked to that sample. Um, and then the first part of these samples, once they were in the, our control, they were evaluated by sensory evaluation. Here is a, actually a photo of my counterpart and partner in crime, in, who's the division chief of the seafood inspection program, Steve Wilson, showing it's a very simple sensory evaluation. And then, so then if that, if that sample was found to have petroleum taint or evaluation of sensory evaluation, then the, the sampling, the testing stopped, the, the waters remain cold, closed. If the sample passes sensory evaluation without any oil, obviously there, then the samples would be tested either here at Nissel, but a, a large amount of them in the Northwest Fisheries Science Center in Seattle for PAHs, which are the um, component of uh, the, um, the carcinogenic, I think it, that's it, um, component of the um, uh, seafood, I'm sorry, of the oil from the deep water horizon and all oils. Now it's interesting, you can, there's been much said about you can get, create PAHs by adding heat to other oils, such food oils, such as hot dogs or hamburgers. And that that's, that is true, but we certainly don't want to have PAHs from oil on your food. So another component in, in response to the Deepwater Horizon disaster that um, NOAA supported was again a Sea Grant effort in the Gulf of Mexico state programs collaborating to develop an industry training program for seafood processors. Um, it was termed Harvest from Open Waters. It was based a lot on this um, HACCP, seafood HACCP training. Um, we um, and uh, as a part of that coalition, we delivered a training and, and delivered that to a group of seafood processors in the Gulf of Mexico states, um, basically explaining the the procedures for opening waters to harvest. I'm um, going through a rather detailed sensory training and then transferring that to what petroleum taint, and then how that process was added to individual HACCP plans, which is an, an, a requirement for each processor to have a HACCP plan to control food safety um, risk and hazards. 
and then that basically was if you evaluate you evaluate your products at receiving and if there's a petroleum taint they're rejected and not allowed to enter into the process um, it's I know when I'm doing these presentations we would people almost every single one said where are the dogs everyone thought they should use dogs um, dogs may smell well but have a good um, sense of smell but it's hard the communication is a little difficult and actually the human nose is very good at, at um, de detecting um, odors certainly petroleum odors um, what we would do is we would to be able to develop samples for the training we'd take a five gallon bucket of water and put two drops of oil that we we, we were able to get from the um, deep water horizon that's that was very difficult to do but we were able to do so over the training put put the samples in this bucket uh, two minutes maybe I forget the exact amount of time and that was it and believe me you could tell that these products were tainted with petroleum um, if you've ever used a lawnmower or, or pumped your own gas or anything it, it's very easy to detect petroleum um, so it was very successful training um, uh, most of the processors would come in rather you know sheepishly thinking that yeah, what am i doing here and, and leave and being very thankful to have had the program and understanding again that petroleum is very easy to detect maybe not to quantify but certainly to detect whether it's there or not and then we train this training eventually was provided to other groups to the media different different um groups as a support for the um, post um, disaster effort I do want to point out one thing here though I think it's lost a lot is that the biggest risk after the oil spill was to the fishermen they were the ones going out into the water to harvest the seafood and if the last thing they wanted to do was you know take their boat or, or drop their gear in uh, oil tainted waters I mean that would be risking their gear which is expensive their vessel their entire livelihood and another point that's important to make I think for everyone kind of to think about as a fisherman, I mean, you go on fishing boats, there are petroleum products, um, lubricants, well, diesel to run run the engine, that if there are spills, they have to be constantly aware of not putting their gear or bring, bringing the seafood up through any petroleum products and then rendering them unsafe. So th it's just an extension of what the industry is already conducting to protect the safety of the seafood. Another example where um, NOAA is involved in seafood safety, even though we're not the frontline regulators, is with the ISSC, the Interstate Sanitation, Shellfish Sanitation Conference was the name of it. Um, it's molluscan shellfish, and Paul was talking a little bit about parts of that. Um, again, this is kind of a consortium of FDA, states, NOAA, and the EPA, and the industry. Um, and the goal is the control of molluscan shellfish safety. Paul pointed out these are filter feeders. They concentrate what's in the water. So if there's ha um, food safety hazards in there, they're going to concentrate them. And a, a decent amount of shellfish are eaten raw, which is another level of safety control that's needed. So these, this is a product that requires additional attention to control the safety. And the states and the FDA are heavily involved in that control process. Um, they still have to come, the processors still comply with the seafood HACCP regulations with these additional controls and the harvest or vessel and processor requirements are added in the term of it, their shalls, things they must do. Um, and then on the state program side, their goal is to maintain open waters and illness responses as they occur so there's a routine testing of waters and shellfish to maintain open waters and 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 that's based on pollution and, and Paul talked a little bit about that so that if I've got a if I'm an oyster harvester or, or have a farm I've got to be able to do that in what are considered open waters and safe now there's also some testing that goes on because of these additional put potential hazards usually based on illness response so if there is an illness they the waters will then be closed and there's a procedure to reopen them for safe harvest um, this can be based on high levels of natural occurring bacteria as an example them or vibrios 
if you're familiar with those, or even and what's becoming more of an issue are algal, algal toxins. Um, this is from algae that that for their growth they produce a, a, a toxin that's a hazard to human health. Um, PSP and their other ones, PSPs, paralytic seafood poisoning. So obviously that doesn't sound very good. And those require uh, a, a strict regime of testing and getting negative results over an amount of time to be able then to open those waters to save harvest and, and consumption of molluscan shellfish. So <clears throat> part of what so what what does the what does um, NOAA provide to this um this uh, com conference this uh, collaboration? Well, a big part of it is the scientific and technical expertise and support on ISSC committees. What Paul just got done presenting is an example of having that type of expertise inside this coalition, this collaboration and conference to support um, strong safety controls. Um, and the areas of NOAA that are involved in the ISC is the laboratory here in NISL, the Office of Aquaculture is in, um, involved, NCOS, which is the, um, part of the National Ocean Science, the Coastal Ocean Science Services, um, with modeling, some of the things Paul was doing. Um, the science centers, which uh, do a lot of analytical science on the fishery side and, and also some seafood work, and then other ones within NOAA. Um, another aspect of that's of in, maybe of interest is the um, effort for aquaculture in federal waters in the United States. And that's actually a more distinct role that NOAA is now playing um, the Seafood Inspection Program is providing that service for molluscan shellfish grown in federal waters. Now, there hasn't been a lot of that happening, but that is the goal. And once that happens, if you are going to grow uh, mussels, for example, in federal waters, you have to be aware of these higher levels of controls you need to comply with. And SIP is there to help with the traceability and hazard control on the um, well, well on the growing side in the federal waters, whereas the FDA continues with the seafood uh, safety regulation and control. Okay, so getting to the final part of the, the presentation, talking about my program. These There are two programs that within NOAA Fisheries or National Marine Fisheries Service with the word fisheries in it. So they have the management and regulation of these animals when they're alive. Seafood indicates it's food, the animal is no longer living. And uh, that's the Seafood Inspection Program and the National Seafood Inspection Laboratory. Um, the Seafood Inspection Program provides fee-for-service programs to seafood processors and for the marketplace, providing um, approved establishments, um, grading systems, if, if that's re desired, and then food safety HACCP programs. And then NISL supports that by doing analytical testing to verify these programs and support these programs. Um, another, so if you're a processor and you um, have a customer that insists that you have a government stamp saying it was um, processed under federal inspection, that processor then when, would go to the seafood inspection program and say, I wanna pay for that, your services to support that. Or if, they, if a customer wants grade A, then this, it's the seafood inspection program, their inspectors, do that type of evaluation to identify that you've meet, met the, um, the program standards. Another aspect of which the seafood inspection program with NISL support is in charge of is seafood export certification. Um, many programs in this whole entity idea is growing across the world. These importing countries want to have a seafood export certi certificate and it's based on those importing country requirements. So it's not the FDA or even NISL, um, sorry, NOAA saying, okay, well, to export this product to this country, it needs to be this. It's the countries that's receiving it, and then SIP provides that service so that the um, US processors can meet the requirements to export to these other countries for business decisions that they may want to do. Um, we they most of them actually require a veterinarian, a, a government net veterinarian, and um, the seafood inspection program has a couple of veterinarians in their program. One of which is based here in Pascagoula with the laboratory, 
and they review and sign that export certificate. Um, analytical testing is required for some and not for others. One program that's well established requiring our testing here in Pascagoula is the Aquatic Animal Byproducts Program, which is fish meal or fish oil and now a bunch of other products where we actually test for bacterial pathogens in those products. And uh, we're developing analytical methods for other export certification programs as they become more desired by, by receiving countries. So it's, we're, we're actually, a, a, NISL is actually a, a, an analytical laboratory that supports the agency needs as opposed to directly doing testing for um, seafood industry um, players. So I know that was a lot. Uh, I was just trying to be an overview, just trying to give a general idea of what seafood safety means and how NOAA kind of interacts with that and collaborates with other partners. Um, and a lot of time it's um, responses as needed, a variety of things that I gave a few examples of, whereas SIP and NISL are the established programs in NOAA's fisheries that are focused on seafood safety with fee for service export certification and seafood safety testing support for the agency. Um, and again, these um, when we have these examples that I, of the examples I've given of these responses as needed, it's supporting the US FDA, coastal states, and other organizations. And with that, hopefully that was of some interest and I'll take any questions if I can figure out how to stop showing this. That was excellent. Thank you, John. Um, uh -huh. And Paul, I see you're still here. Um, I want to. There's one question that came in during your presentation that I think you could both comment on. And then um, with that, there are a bunch of other questions that we can get through as well. Um, one was, is there any validity to the old saying, "Never eat oysters in a month without an R"? <laughs> um, I'm going to give a real nerdy answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> Love nerdy answers here. <laughs> completely conditional on this, the temperature of the water and where you are. So, I mean, if you're up north, if you're eating oysters, and, you know, the Chesapeake Bay area, I don't, it's, all, it's all dependent upon the bacterial accounts and things like that. So, um, I guess to give the short answer, it's completely conditional. Well, yeah, it's, it's warm. Generally, without, without our means, it's a warmer month, right? That, and that's where that comes from. Um, I will say though that the, the seafood, uh, the, the oyster industry in Louisiana harvests and sells a lot of oysters that in months that don't have an R. So there are, I, I have encountered in my career a lot of people who vehemently disagree with that. <laughs> Great, thank you both for that. Um, uh, so another question that came in from the audience is how frequently are dive studies used to inform or corroborate models? Um, I can I can start that and John you can help out if you need to but um, they they're used currently they've been used in the past they're they're great tracers uh, it's the the methodologies for folks listening is really uh, you place dye in the water and you see how the water moves out uh, from an area and if you have a harvestable zone you try to understand tracing that way um, those that's data that can be fed into a model uh, for those exact conditions uh, really for for calibration purposes. Uh, so uh, it's been wonderful methodologies in the past and still very valid uh, here today for use to, uh, in modeling and the regulatory process. Uh, I, I think FDA actually comes out and does the dive studies um, for um, the, the policy. They work with the state agencies and they do them together. It's a really good collaboration. Uh, whoever thought that up was brilliant not to silo it, but to actually incorporate uh, all levels of of the process so uh, yes John did I leave anything out no, that's good the only real in personal impact with any dyes that I was using seafood was a, a lifetime or two ago working on a tuna boat and they would throw dye packets in the water to try to keep the fish in the net so it has nothing to do with that <laughs> awesome great thank you both for those answers um, I have a question on uh, the pH levels for sensory evaluation, what PAH levels were human sniff testers able to detect? And they're asking specifically about not external contamination, but um, accumulation in the tissue. Right, so 
so those two were not correlated if the in, in the in this process evaluation by sensory analysis was a trigger a yay nay if it was nay and there was no evaluation then it would go for um pah testing so to my knowledge that that the answer to that question was never really fully investigated um because it that wasn't the goal the, the goal was to not have to run a PAH test on an HPLC on every sample collected. Because again, if you could smell it, then it was all bets were off. It, you, you, there's no need to test it. Great. Uh, sorry, that, that didn't really answer the question, but that's what no, it was. Thank you. Um, another question uh, that both of you could answer, or yeah, you both might be able to um, answer is what happened to the NOAA Muscle and Oyster Watch program? Is data still being collected and used in evaluating seafood safety? Yeah, do you want me to take that one, John? Yeah, sure, go ahead, Paul, that's up your hand. Sure, so the Muscle Watch uh, program is still uh, around. I think they restricted their sampling. Um, just a little background, it, Muscle Watch was a, a group that works with NOAA very closely, it's funded by NOAA, and they would do a lot of the monitoring for seafood safety uh, all around the country. Um, they would do it every year. I think they've been reduced every five years just from uh, funding constrictions and things like that. Um, but for the state of Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama, I think they're planning on doing it uh, in, the, in the fall next year. Um, so they're, they're very alive and well and doing their thing. I think they've just uh, uh, consorted the, the, their methodologies and their sampling regimes to a more efficient uh, model or methodology um, uh, design to maximize the um, the spatial extent from which the Muscle Watch um, acquires their data. I'm set to meet with them actually at uh, the GOMA All Hands next month. Yeah, right on. Yes, they're very yeah. live and well in doing good. Thank you. I, and I, my, my only comment to that is, as it's from an analytical perspective, as new methods are developed and when we're able to use modern and state-of-the-art test methods, generally being able to detect whatever you're looking for at less smaller and smaller levels you have a the concern when you do that is you have to be able to co correlate that to previous results using earlier methods and that tends to be a real issue um, i know with our work at the ISSC they to be able to open waters based on test results. You come in with a new test that's bitter, bigger, better, easier, all kinds of reasons to use it, and you get results you, that you have to then correlate with what was find, be found before. So I know that we have been looking at the Muscle Watch data, I'm bringing it back to the question, and, and I'm not an expert at that, but there's a lot of long, long-term data that can be very useful is trying to understand the changes that are going on and the impacts that it has. And um, a big part of that is being at the same location every time and you, when we do um, surveys, which is not quite muscle watch, but along those lines, you they always go to the same place trying to use the same procedures to be able to make sense of the data you get. Great, thank you both for that. Um, I have one question about um, the avail availability of uh, the data regarding the identification of potential pathogens in the aquatic animal byproducts um, and whether uh, that's used at all for monitoring pathogen levels in the environment and exposure risk. Short answer, no. Um, what we're doing is, is based on the requirements, it, and a lot of it is the EU, it's it's, so it's fish meal to be exported. Why would you do that? Well, you're a company looking for the, the a customer who's going to pay a higher price. That's what's driving that. And it's the actual EU requiring that the state, the government of the United States does this testing for pathogens specifically. That's their requirement. It's, it's, it's our goal. Again, um, the NOAA fisheries, NOAA, is in the Department of Commerce, so it's not our goal to be adding restrictions at all. I mean, there are other things you could say we should be testing for it. Um, I come from the from industry, and it, it's kind of interesting to have governments get in the way of I've got a customer, stay out of it. That's you know our approach here in the U.S. 
Um, it's not in the EU, obviously. And for fish meal, of all things, it's an ingredient. It's going to get reheated by the final user in the EU or China or wherever it might be going. They're going to kill what other pathogens or, or can design a program that would do it. But uh, let's leave logic out of it. And that's why we're testing for the pathogens. It's purely to meet the EU requirements. It isn't, we don't, now, you, to those fish meal processors can also sell their fish meal or fish oil or whatever it is in the U.S., and then that would be under the purview of meeting the FDA's requirements for being a safe product. Great, thank you. Um, another audience question, um, are temperature and precipitation forecasts used at all in your seafood safety work? Well, Paul, I think you, you mentioned that in your talk. I mean, yeah, that's that's important on the growing side, I think, is mm -hmm. you know, on the environmental side. I'm, I mean, there are things that happen like hurricanes. I mean, it's not necessarily just rainfall and temperature where the FDA has established procedures that must happen before they will, um, you know, you can allow for that seafood that might have been in cold stores already processed to come into commerce but not necessarily temperature and water numbers per se. Um, but I think Paul mentioned had a very good job of pointing out that it did impact the growing of, of the oysters as well as the impacts of seafood safety on them. Yeah, you got it, John. Uh, that, that's right. I was think the forecasting, uh, there's a couple of conditionally approved areas in the northern Gulf, uh, outside and inside of the state of Mississippi waters, um, that you can have a certain amount of rainfall, and they project from that that the river stages would be high and it would close a zone. So I would say yes to that question, Asia. And, it can and be actually, forecast. And actually, a colleague in NCOS um, up in Charleston is as is using some weather type modeling to look at temperature and water, but I'm sure it's temperature to then model the growth of potential pathogens. So it's kind of second or third gen, um, deviation beyond just the growth part of it. But yes, I mean, that that's a very good question. And those are the type of things that, um, that NOAA is trying to do is take some of these models they developed and for example, like the weather service where there's a lot of effort and you know, modeling and detecting and, and evaluating things and then be able to use them for other reasons and the modeling of uh, pathogen growth or things in the water is, is a good example of that. Great, thank you. And I see we're just about at the top of the hour, but I have one more question and then we'll um, close out. But uh, the last audience question is, if there is an oil spill nearby, but no oil observed at a specific site, is that site closed anyways? That's a good question. Um, so in, in federal waters, in for using the example of DWH, obviously, yes, they, they just close everything precautionarily. If it's in state waters, um, here in the Gulf of Mexico, where Paul and I um, live and, and work, there are oil seeps, oil spills, if you will, not all the time, but it's not unheard of on a much smaller scale. And then the smaller scale will come in to where the experience, yeah, you close the waters around the potential area, but not the whole Gulf. But so yes, and then the procedures to open them up based on the, the, the regulatory experience. Awesome. Well, thank you guys both so much. Um, we really appreciate those presentations and all of your answers to the questions. Um, I want to point again to the upcoming schedule of, um, of presentations in this One Health webinar series. The next one is um, next week on June 6th on harmful algal blooms in the Great Lakes. I will so, say, I will say, Asia, I'm really looking forward to that one myself. Awesome. Well, good. We've got Paul's or John's endorsement. Sorry. Um, so we <laughs> hope to see you all there. Thank you guys so much. And thank you all for joining us today. Take care. Thank you, Asia. Bye bye. Is it going to go? Okay. A little close. <laughs> there we go.